Searching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Saturday afternoon. What we're doing here is a lecture. Going to be bringing on Pat Flynn from Chronicles of Strength and Word on Fire Ministries, bringing him back on, and also uh, first time guest, Dr. James Madden, who is professor of philosophy at Benedictine College. He's going to be joining as well. What they are going to do is deliver a uh, lecture or a talk, if you will, on philosophy. Effectively, you know, what is philosophy? philosophy and why we should do it. And of course, it's going to be an ongoing series we'll do uh, usually on Saturdays as far as the frequency that will be to be determined. But this will be the first of the uh, uh, of such installation. So going to be bringing them on. Uh, coming up next, Pat, uh, Pat Flynn and Dr. Uh, Jim Madden. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Oh, always yeah. good to have you back on, Dr. Madden. Yeah. Uh, this Thanks is for having me. First, your first time. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate you doing this and looking forward to and it. Please call me Jim, too. Okay, Jim, sounds yeah. good. And, you know, I... Um, you can call me doctor. If That's you right. Exactly. <laughs> if, if, if you say, you might as well say, be. <laughs> if you say Dr. Madden, I'll think you're talking about my sister, the veterinarian. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, uh, Pat, like I was saying, you might as well be doctor because uh, I, I think you have this stuff down working on that honorary th the honorary yeah, so thank right. you yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know like i said um what we're doing is just a basic introduction to what is philosophy and why should we do it as catholics so what i'm gonna do is just kind of you know pass it over to y'all and y'all take it wherever you want to go yeah sure well let me just give a, a general plan of where uh, i hope these this series will eventually go which is uh to help introduce people uh to or give a deeper understanding of of the Thomistic system as a whole. And Jim and I have had a number of conversations about this on my podcast yeah. in the sense that I think Thomas Aquinas um, fits within what, uh, what I would just call perennial philosophy or, or big tent Platonism, right? Like good, good philosophy has marked off from, from, from so sophism. I don't, I certainly don't think it stopped with Thomas Aquinas. I think that this is, uh, is uh, of course a, a school of thought that has uh, been under, um, constant development and refinement to this very day. And there's a lot of really cool, I think, cutting edge thought that is happening uh, within this sort of big tent platonic Thomistic system or tradition. So, so that's my hope. And I, I thought just for the first series, we would just go to the absolute rudiments and, and basics and just talk about, well, what is philosophy and, and, and why should we do it? So how does that sound to you, Jim? That sounds great. Sounds excellent. Yeah. Right. Sweet. <laughs> so, uh, Jim, you've been you've been actually teaching philosophy now for how many years? Oh, gosh. I mean, if you count graduate school, I, you know, first started as a teaching assistant in the fall of 1996. Right. Um, and, you know, I started as, a, you know, a Ph.D. professor type. Uh, what would that be? That would have been summer of 2002 is when I got my doctorate and started teaching at St. Thomas in Minnesota. So I've, I have, uh, I, I have burnt some decades on this project, right? So. Right. And, well, the reason I bring that up is because you have so many years teaching this, you probably have a couple ideas on where the best starting point is. So yeah. where do you like to introduce people to philosophy or how do yeah. you like to introduce people yeah. to philosophy? Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there's, there, we might make a distinction of how I would like to and how I actually do. Right. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Because in, and, but this, okay, th th this could be a feature or it could be a bug. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my, the department I teach in is very um, traditionally Thomistically oriented. Right. And, and even within that, it's uh, very oriented toward Laval school Thomism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where philosophy of nature is very, very primary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're, and so, we're not going to get into all the different schools of Thomism yeah, today, yeah, gentle no, listeners. Don't exactly. worry. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. That's, so, right, that's, so, that's for lecture eight. Yeah. yeah. And so at at the um, college I teach at, there's a three course philosophy requirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the first course is a course in the philosophy of nature. Okay. Um, now we could, we could debate, you know, how, you know, whether that's the place to start. Okay, but that's where we start. So our 
our students begin with an introduction to basically Aristotle's physics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then work their way up from there into ethics and philosophical psychology, according to like the typical, um, you know, um, hierarchy of disciplines within Thomism. Okay. Right. Uh, even our gen ed students do that mm -hmm. at Benedictine. Okay. Now, um, yeah, so that's how, so we actually begin them at this college with the philosophy of nature. So they, they get heavy to mystic uh, <laughs> matter form privation off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, but within that, even though, I, I actually start, I actually start with the five just early dialogues of Plato, right? So the, um, the Euthyphro, the Mino, the Crito, uh, uh, the Phaedo, uh, the Apology, I can say, sorry, pardon me, the, the, the Euthyphro, the Apology, the Crito, the Mino, and, and the Phaedo is where I start them. So I basically drag uh, my intro students through those five dialogues, okay, right. because um, it is it is it is the the there certainly are pre-Socratic philosophers, right? But it's the it's the first sort of self-conscious attempt to sort of make a case for philosophy as a way of life, as opposed to other ways of life that were on offer in Athens. Okay, so that that's where I begin them is with this sort of invitation to philosophizing as a way of life. Right. Yeah. Right? Plato, find in Plato. Yeah. Yeah. Plato is yeah. the invitation. I often tell yeah. people who are busy, like if you do nothing else. Yeah. While you're playing Mario Kart, just yeah. bring up Plato on YouTube and just mm -hmm. listen to the dialogue, right? If you yeah. do not, if you if you do yeah. nothing else, right? And and yeah. you know, depending how sweaty you get with Mario Kart, it shouldn't be that hard to comprehend at least some of it, right? Exactly. Um, and so, can I make another, another point about that? Do you mind? Right. Yeah, please. Okay, so um, one of the one of the great underread classics of modern thought that I think everybody should read is Max Weber's lecture, "Science as Vocation." Okay. And in that lecture, one of the many interesting insights he has into modernity as a phenomenon is Weber points out that he thinks we're returning to polytheism. Okay. He sees, he thinks that we're, that because of the, the competition of values, there are many deities on offer now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he, he worries that, you know, this isn't how he puts it, but so I'll, I'll put it is we're returning to the same kind of tragic problem that you saw um, in in the pre-Socratic situation where there are many values on offer, there is no one overarching metaphysical scheme, right? Mm -hmm. And all there is is conflict available. And, you know, if you wonder how that ends, you know, read Aeschylus, okay? So, you know, what is Plato ultimately doing? The way I understand Plato is he's ultimately defending uh, a kind of rational monotheism for the first time, okay? Right. This, I mean, this is, this is Euthyphro. This right. is Euthyphro. Yeah. What is the question in Euthyphro is what is piety? What is it to be pious? And he's, de and he's debating with uh, a pagan priest who would have been a polytheist. Okay. Um, if you get into Plato's dialogue, the Protagoras, it's very clear that he thinks we need something that is the good, right? Because we cannot, we cannot live a life beholden to many, many ultimate goods. There has to be an ultimate good. Okay. Right. And so I now introduce students um, to philosophy with that question, right? Mm -hmm. um, as, as a tension between monotheism and polytheism, right? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I think what you have in those dialogues um, is ultimately Plato's attempt to defend Socrates uh, as the most pious man in Athens, right? Because of his monotheism. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a moral entry point for you. It's a moral entry point. Yeah. 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 So, so I like this a lot and this is how I like to, to prompt people too, is you just think about the types of questions people care about. And of course, questions that concern the competition of, of values mm -hmm. are, are always going to be very interesting to people, right? How do yes. we adjudicate these disputes about values, especially in a pluralistic society? So I think that's, right. that, that's great. And I think maybe we should maybe just back up a couple steps and just, uh, and just talk about like, yeah, you know, what is what is philosophy, right? Let's start there. Well, I like I like Plantinga's definition. It's it's thinking really hard about things. Okay, that's 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 one. Yeah, that's Tradi Hegel. That's Hegel's too, by the way. Yeah, it's Hegel. And yeah, traditionally, yeah, yeah. love of wisdom. But I guess yeah. to be more precise, you know, Norris Clark would tell us that philosophy is that sort of critical reflective turn that we make to try to illumine our experience and set it in relation of the whole. And what captured me into philosophy was realizing that it seemed to be where I needed to go to get the questions answered that I cared about most. Questions about who am I? Where am I from? What am I doing here? How am I supposed to behave? And where, if anywhere, am I going next, right? Questions concerning yeah. 
origin, destiny, meaning, morality, the, the biggest questions, right? Science, very fascinating. It's very important, and I think it can inform our philosophy in a lot of ways, but it's not going to answer the, the questions that at least were most important to me, and I would argue were most are most important to everybody at the end of the day. Now, I'm not even saying philosophy can answer all of those questions. All I'm saying is I got started with philosophy because it seemed to me that was the best shot <laughs> that yeah. I had at answering these these types of questions. And I even more specifically was was drawn into metaphysics and ethics for those particular reasons. And I think maybe we should say at the bat, like philosophy itself is is sort of the only discipline, the only intellectual discipline that examines the assumptions of, of all the other disciplines, all the sciences, right? This is why we have philosophy of science, and then also examines its own assumptions, right? right. right. And that's why it's so fundamental. And it has many different branches, right? So philosophy yeah. has logic, which studies the structure of thought. Thought has a structure. It has metaphysics, which is a study of the, really the most general structures of reality as a whole, right? It's most basic principles and laws, the study of being as being. There's philosophy of, of science, as we've talked about, philosophy of nature. There is, there's ethics, of course. There's philosophy of music, which Oddly enough, being a musician growing up, I I pay almost no attention to, right? Pretty much a philosophy of everything. I'm sure I'm missing some gin, but um, yeah, it kind of took a turn from 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 what you were saying. But I think it, it all connects that the, the entry point for me and how I try to get people interested in philosophy is showing showing them where or how it connects with the things that they already care about. Yep. Right? So the one of my my favorite kind of one off definitions of philosophy comes from. Uh, a 20th century philosopher named Wilfred Sellers, and he defined philosophy as, how's it? it? It's the discipline that considers how things, in the broadest sense of things, to include cabbages, kings, and finger snaps, hang together in the broadest sense of things. Okay, so it's this attempt to have an overall view of things. Okay, um, and but I think I think maybe more substantively. I think of philosophy in terms of the examined life that Plato, you know, claims that you know the oracle sent Socrates to go defend, right? The unexamined life is not worth living. Okay, and you know, you think of it in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Basically, the happy person, the wise person, you know, someone who has pursued wisdom, is the person who, on their deathbed, can give reasons for how they lived. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. right. And so, uh, I think the the aspiration of the philosopher is to live an examined life. And what's an examined life? It's a li it's a life that you can give reasons for it. You didn't live by accident. Okay. You didn't, you didn't live by luck. You didn't live by chance. You lived uh, based on reasons. Okay. Um, and I think it, that's what it is to be a philosopher is to, is, is to, to try to limit um, the degree to which what you pursue in your life, what you value, what you think to be true, right? Um, even just your practicalities, right? That those are less governed by chance and luck and accident and more governed by reasons, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the degree to which one achieves a life for which he or she can give reasons is the degree to which they are a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's excellent. I, I love yeah. that. One uh, real quick, I just I just want to say to the to the audience who who um, who are tuning into the stream is that I think a lot of these conversations are, are best as conversations. So please bring questions and and stuff like that, and we'll we'll jam on then as yeah. as we move along here. Uh, Jim, to your point, um, did you maybe a little bit of personal history would be be helpful and his and and here as we kind of kind of mm -hmm. steer more in the direction of this big tent Platonism we're, yeah. we're talking about because my entry to philosophy was was not with plato it was not with aristotle it actually yeah. started with people like mark twain and hl mencken like writers yeah. i was i was yeah. really interested yeah. in and it's it, it started because they 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 had different like philosophical essays i mean one that struck me when i was very young was uh, have you ever read what is man by mark twain it's yes this, yeah it's yeah. A, it, like this horribly deterministic essay right like yeah. You, yeah. and like it like shook me when i was very young uh and like really startled me and i'm like and and so I like was was really fascinated by it and and the philosophical question of determinism at the time as as it, and and it's so funny because you it's it's the same thing to it's the same debate now as it was when Twain was around as it was with the with the atomists right so yeah, it's like, yeah. It, it, yeah. the same theme cycle over and over but then no, you know, that's that's a truth by the way right there there is nothing new under the sun man right, right yeah hundred hundred yeah. percent and that's 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 a kind of cool and startling thing at the same time when, when you recognize that. So, but they eventually kind of turned me on uh, to the the different atheists and, and existentialists who, so I kind of cut my teeth with, with those guys. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, long story short, what I, what I found in, in trying to pursue 
philosophy in a sort of reductionist or, or naturalistic direction is it it not only couldn't answer the questions that I felt needed to be answered, um, it actually had to start trying to argue that those questions were invalid or meaningless, right? Or they didn't make sense. And uh, at some point, I, I realized that um, I've got to see <laughs> if there are other options available to me at this point, right? Because this yeah. this doesn't seem to be doing the job, right? And you know, different different schools of flavors of naturalism and reductionism uh, have different degrees of how much they're they're willing to deny or, or count as meaningless. But as soon as a philosophy starts uh, trying to ex rather than explain, but to explain away uh, our moral experience, our conscious experience, things like that. Um, at least for me, uh, in, in sort of my uh, journey and in investigations was when I, I begin to part with those schools of philosophy. And it was going, you know, back, of course, to to a whole tradition of thinkers, Plato included, up through Aquinas and many contemporary Thomists, that I that I seem to have found a, a, a philosophical school of thought that a very broad philosophical school school of thought that made sense often with great technical ingenuity of what the common man believes. And that's how Chesterton right. described Aquinas, right? He's like, Aquinas's philosophy is the closest thing you'll get to what the common man <laughs> in the street <laughs> believes, right? And and Michael, I shared a link with you if you want to if you want to share it with the audience. But what what are what are some of these things, right, that that are kind of uh part of the Thomistic deal? And I have I have five points here that, that I want to share that I think will be good uh, for our conversation, Jim. But but why don't I pause mm -hmm. there and see if you had any thoughts on anything that I that I just said so yeah. far? Um, just in terms of you know, just kind of the autobiographical stuff, like how how one got into philosophy, or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. sure, that'd be yeah. So so um, you know, for me, uh, I mean, I got into it very accidentally. <laughs> so so, um, so I I uh, in a sense, right? So I I had. Uh, transferred schools under duress shall we say after my freshman year of college right and um i uh it was me with my advisor the day before classes started and he asked me if there's anything i i wanted to study and i said and i'm not i'm kind of i don't really have any idea what i want to do with myself but you know i had this political science class where we read you know marx and john locke and nietzsche and people like that i found that interesting and i said you know do you have that sort of thing here he's like yes yes and he was a he was a professor of philosophy so he jammed me into three philosophy classes and a theology class right there because he because he, he knew the people he could get me into them because the classes started the next day okay yeah and i remember i came back to the guy uh paul johnson at st Omer college who's a, a wonderful human being uh, I came back to him the, about two weeks later and I said, so is this your day job? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, is this how you make a living, right? And do you have to have another job in science? No, this is what I do. I said, well, I want to do this. And he's like, well, let's, let's just slow down here. Like, let's see, you know, all right. But anyway, so after just being immersed in it, you know, across the board for my entire schedule, first semester of my, soft, my sophomore year of college, I just, I, I, there was no turning back for me, right? Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that the questions being asked in these classes were, was the stuff that had been on my mind since I was like eight years old. Right. right. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that, isn't that, isn't that it? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. 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 I remember, you know, cause I, I'm old enough that I grew up on the, on the tail end of the, of the first cold war. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember, uh, you know, thinking, you know, if, if the, if the world war three happened and all the humans got killed, like whether or not the earth would still exist in the same sense. Right. And so, you know, I mean, like as a little kid, these things occur to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some of some yeah. mine as a little kid were like early matrix style thoughts. Right? Yeah. I remember yeah. like looking out my grandparents window, like am I dreaming? How do I know this isn't a dream? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Like that. And, then, and then like, as soon as I read yeah. Descartes, I'm like, he beat me to it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So as an undergrad, I got really into, um, German philosophy. So I was very into Hegel, very into Heidegger. And that was basically the plan, um, for going to grad school I wanted to do. And then, um, yeah, I, I go to Kent State for my master's and it just, it worked out, uh, uh, better to work on Wittgenstein and Sellers there, and that's why I worked there. I found that's very interesting. So I wanted to work broadly in philosophy of mind uh, and neo-Kantianism. When I got to Purdue, the, the Kant guy left like <laughs> my first semester there, and the, yeah. that all got messed up. So I, I just I basically fell into writing on Leibniz because the smartest person that I could write with, Jan Cover, was a Leibniz guy, mm -hmm. and eventually um, that led me into Aquinas. Right, so like I, I ended up into uh, kind of classical philosophy kind of as an end around. Right? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wasn't, I wasn't really seriously reading scholastic philosophy until I was relatively late in graduate school. Right. Yeah. Which is yeah. not totally uncommon. Not totally uncommon, especially for, for philosophers of my generation. Right. Cause this is, it was sort of a, a reemerging 
uh, interest in scholasticism in the late 1990s in American universities. Yeah. Right. So we're not that different. It's interesting because I, I feel like I've known you for a while, become very yeah. good friends, but I never heard that yeah. story before. So this oh, is really, really yeah. 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 You never yeah. told me that that's, that's history, but I, never so told that, I got, I got bounced out of my first college. Uh, you may have told me that, but yeah, not yeah. your, yeah. not your trajectory I, to, I had, a four, I had a 4.0 GPA just for the record there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let that, so, let that be clear. It's, it's, there's yeah. plenty of ways to get kicked out of college. Right? So, so we were both kind of later to Thomism. Yeah. In our from from yeah. when we started, you know, really taking philosophy seriously. So yeah. Thomism was kind of where we where we wound up. It wasn't where we started, right? Exactly. Again, not an uncommon theme. And in fact, Michael, I recommended this on your show last time. I'm going to recommend it again because I'm sure people would be interested in some good starting philosophical texts. Is Mortimer Adler's Ten Philosophical Mistakes? If you want a really good philosophical text, it sort of gives you a survey of the history of philosophical ideas. And that tries to pinpoint where things have gone off the rails with modern thinkers. And he picks a lot on on John Locke in this book. Like, like, really, like yeah. poor poor Locke just just gets it. Um, he's just uh, you know, yeah. but it, but it's but it's great. You know, he's going to give you a sort of traditional defense, very Thomistic, of consciousness and its objects, knowledge, uh, free will. So all the big philosophical questions. What Adler tries to do in this book is identify certain thinkers or schools of thought that thought poorly about these these subject matters at a particular time and have not been properly course corrected. And Adler's proposal is we can actually fix a lot of these issues if we just go back to the great tradition, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. And I'm obviously very, very sympathetic to that. Jim, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah. I'll say for me, some, we, we've actually talked about this recently, but for me, a similar figure there was Alistair McIntyre. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I had started, I actually, my, my, my advisor in, as an undergrad had written his dissertation basically on um, McIntyre and Nietzsche. Right. And, and uh, kind of taking up the, you know, McIntyre's great gambit. Like there's two views, there's Nietzsche and there's Aristotle. That's it. Right. You, you know, and I don't think I ever got that, that um, decision point out of my head. And late in grad school, I started reading McIntyre like very voraciously. Right. And it was McIntyre um, who really, in terms of someone I was reading, that got me very interested in classical philosophy and the recovery of classical philosophy. And another person, Jeff Brower, uh, who is still at Purdue, and I think is like the one of the great less known names among Thomists, and I think he should be much better known, right? Uh, you know, he also got me reading Thomas directly because he had written on Thomas, and yeah. But it, but it, it, in terms of like big you know, people you've heard of influence, it was McIntyre. It was kind of like what Adler is to you is what McIntyre was to me. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple yeah. of, of thinkers that were like that to me. Adler was, was a major one. Um, partly because I read him, but I'll stop with the, his, the biographical detail after this, but yeah. partly because I read him very early on, I read his book, how to read a book. And yeah. I didn't realize that he was so interested in philosophy of religion until later. And I went back and I read his book, uh, how to think about God, which he wrote as a pagan, yeah. of the time he he later yeah. became christian i think in his 60s and it became like catholic in his 90s or something yeah. like that right yep. um and that just like kind of blew my mind because i'm like wait you can think about god philosophically this is like this is this is a thing yeah. that people do right now the interesting tidbit there is that he actually doesn't think that aquinas's um traditional proofs work he actually critiques them yeah. um and at the time, I thought, okay, these these critiques are probably probably fair. Uh, but now, I now I think Adler was wrong. I think he just, yeah. I, think, I think he beefed it totally. But yeah. but he was a guy that that really set me on that that path of, eventually yeah. to to theism and then Catholicism. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think you make a, a very good point there. Um, and, uh, implicitly, what you're saying, and this is one reason why I'm kind of reluctant. When people ask, how do I get started in philosophy? Because I think a lot of times what they're asking is, how do I get started and how do I put it to an end? Like what's like what's the one one stop philosophy shop I can hit and it's over mm -hmm. right okay and um I think I love the example you give Pat about how like you were like Adler got you going you were probably like an Adler guy at one point like Adler 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 right yeah it's, and, it's still and, am right still, yeah, still are but you're still also like beyond it now too like yeah. I, you know mm -hmm. like I critique him now I'm moving on there's other sources I'm looking at uh, you, right. you know what I mean um and so much of like what I've read and done and thought were just stepping stones. Right. Mm -hmm. At the time, they weren't stepping stones to me. Right. Yeah. They were mm -hmm. like, oh, this is the big one. This is the right one now. Right. right. 
And then, and then you, and, and you read it and you live it and you think it maybe for, I don't know, in my case, a decade or something. Right. And, and then, and then you like, you, you start to like get a critical distance from it. So you can take et cetera, et cetera. Right. And yes. that's why I, I think it's so important to emphasize um, philosophy is not a book, right? Uh, philosophy is not even a singular set of ideas, right? Philosophy is a lifestyle. It's right. a way of it's a way it's of a being way, in the world, right? It's a way of being in the world. It's an attitude towards the world, right? And it's and what is that? It is a commitment to living an examined life. And a commitment to living an examined life might mean even though Adler like changed your life, you might need to examine him closely someday. Right. And and yeah. yes, not only that, and not only have I, but Jim, I'm sure you'll see this as the case, is yeah, you you often find a, a book or a thinker or a school of thought where you where you come to it. Uh, you spend a lot of time with it. You think, yes, this is it. You spend more time with it. You get a critical distance. Uh, yeah. You you start to you start to think, yeah, there was this was a stepping stone. This was really good. You, you maybe you part with it for a little bit, but then you might actually come back to it and yeah. get more riches from it that like ten years later that you totally missed. Yeah. I mean, look, here's here's a great example of that right That's now. That's my Aristotle, personal issue. With, yeah, Aristotle's, Aristotle's yeah. ethics, right? Yeah. Plato, Aquinas, yeah. all of this, right? Yeah. Where it's like it's a stepping stone. Then you think, then you think foolishly, I'm um, beyond it. And then you hit a point where, for whatever reason, you go back to it and you realize, oh, no, I was (laughs) right. How how arrogant I was, right? Yeah. Uh You know, I I, I reread Plato's Republic for the first time in a lot of years this summer, and it blew me away. I I always tell people they should read Dostoevsky's um, Brothers Karamazov once every decade. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like read it. Read it in your 20th birthday. Read it in your 30th. Read it in your 40s. Read it in your 50s. Right. Yeah, uh, right. And it, it will every time you realize, oh, my gosh, I had no idea what was going on. Now I get it. Now I get it. Now I get it. Yeah, that w- that was literally Adler's advice about Aristotle's ethics. He said, you have to read it 12 times. I don't know why he picked 12. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but that just seems right to me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just, you just and, and, and like you, Jim, I, I'm sure he would have said, like, it, it can't all be in the same year. Right. You got to right. do you got to read it once when you're 18, once when you're 25, yeah. 32, 46, 57. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I, I I really want to emphasize all of this in, because I think so much of what goes on, um, you know, on the internet among Catholics is to see philosophy as an apologetic means. Okay, and and it certainly has great fruits for that. Okay, but I'm more interested in getting people to see philosophy as a way of life, <laughs> as, as as living an examined life. And I think exactly. it's sort of, yeah, it, it's sort of you know to use like. Um, a sports analogy, right? If all you're trying to do is to beat some particular opponent, as opposed to getting good at the sport, right? Uh, though, like the just trying to beat, just trying to game and win one game at a time will work one game at a time. But in the long run, it'd be better just to get good at the sport, right? I agree. Yeah, and so I think if you just take up philosophy as a lifestyle, the apologetic stuff down the road will take care of itself. It might be less satisfying for your daily Twitter buzz, right? Mm -hmm. But it will, in the long run, it will take care of all that too, right? But it takes patience. It takes a lot of like, I don't know, I'm working on it. Yeah. You you have to do it for its own sake. And it's it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, that's, uh, for me, um, you know, I I write for a number of websites and some of them are just outward apologetics websites, but I never had the intention of being an apologist. What happened is I just, I just tried to do philosophy well. And in conversations with people, they realized, that sounds pretty interesting or, or convincing. Can you write an article on that? Right? Yeah. People started just calling me an apologist. I'm like, I'm actually, I'm like, I yeah. guess I am in like the broad sense that like I hope I can give reasons for the things yeah. that I believe, but I yeah. don't do philosophy so I can engage in apologetic battles. And I think that's exactly yeah. what you're saying, right? I do philosophy because I love yeah. to do it, right? You know, it's it's you know Cardinal Newman, one of his great apologetic works, is titled you know Apologia Pro Vita Su, an mm-hmm. a, you know an apology for my life. Right. Mm. Like that is, that is Newman examining his life, like looking back relatively late and saying, this is how I live and this is why. Yeah. Right. So, so Jim, before we start engaging with the audience here, do you mm-hmm. want me to just kind of go through the five summary points I have given of Thomism and then we'll get just yeah, let's some, do it. Let's some, do some it. conversation yeah. going on. This will yeah. actually, um, if people want to go deeper on, um, into this, this Jim, this will reflect the conversation we had on what is Platonism. So yeah. we'll, we'll take a similar hey, direction. Hey, there. Uh-huh. hey, Pat Flinch, classic, if I may. Yeah. So, um, there's a there's an episode Jim and I did on my podcast called What Is Platonism. So if you like what we're saying here, and if you want to do some extracurricular work within the series, check that one out because uh, it'll probably go a little bit deeper than than what we cover here. So on my blog, and I think Michael linked it, I have um, foolishly tried to summarize Thomism 
in almost one page. And I say foolishly because anything like this is always going to be inadequate, right? But I think it'll at least get the conversation started. Or or somebody's written a dissertation on why you're wrong. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and because and, it's your dissertation, they'll defend it to the to the to the teeth, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And and I, I know the um the purpose of this series is to help introduce people or deepen uh understanding within the Thomistic system. So that's that's just what we're going to be working with. So let me read my um let me do this, Jim. Let me read my first uh, summary paragraph or two, and then I'd just like mm -hmm. to get your your thoughts and comments on it. Uh, and then we can go through the different points and and take some questions from the audience. So um, here, here's here's Thomism in one paragraph to me, <laughs> my best attempt, right? So Thomism, and, and by that I mean, I really just mean the broad philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, but of, of course that would include contemporary Thomas as well. So, so Thomism holds that the universe is made up of a hierarchy of diverse grades of being from elements to plants to humans to angels, all of which are dependent upon the non-contingent, absolute, self-subsistent self being God who creates, sustains, and moves everything else which exists in accord with its nature. Further, that man himself is a microcosm within a macrocosm, being a union of matter, body, and spirit, mind, which is, which is the substantial but immaterial form of the body and destined for life after death. Man by nature desires to know reality and its highest truths and deepest causes, that's metaphysics, which ultimately is supposed to lead us to God. However, this possibility stretches beyond this life and man's natural capacities. Thus, if man is to attain eternal happiness, he must be instructed by a divine faith that transcends philosophy and his actions must be guided by a divine love that builds on and perfects nature through grace. What do you think of that, Jim? Yeah, no, I know. I, I could find nothing to disagree with in that. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, with the, we're in the uh, mutual admiration society here then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, and, and it'd be interesting to, to, to see how you would distinguish it from other like scholastic heavy hitters like SCOTUS or something like that. Right. Um, that, that might be kind of a catch all. I mean, scholastic, well, you eh, be careful. Like, like there's certain, um, the, the anomalous wouldn't fit in there, right? But I mean, but uh, but that's that would actually be a good definition. What does it mean to be a scholastic, right? right. I think that would fit pretty well. Yeah. well. Let's let's go through those five points because you brought up anomalism. Yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is by no means original to me. What I'm going to present here, other Thomists have have yeah. said that it, it, it often one of the best ways to understand Thomism or Big Ten Platonism is in contrast to many of the tendencies or schools of thought of modern philosophy. So why don't we get into yeah. that a little bit here? So the five points of of, of Thomism. That I think, again, accord with a common sense view of reality, even though we often have to do a lot of technical philosophy to kind of justify this, would be as follows. So we'll just take it point by point here. So, so number one, that there are, there are essences, right? And that essences are a real feature of the world and they are knowable. So there's such a thing as a human nature, an acorn nature, a dog nature, and that through scientific and philosophical inquiry, we can really come to understand what these things are, however imperfectly, how they operate under certain conditions, and what what really perfects them as the kind of yeah. things they are. So that is that is to say that Thomism is anti nominalist, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think I think you have to say that definitely, right? Um, you know, I, I mean, this might get too technical, but on the spectrum of realism probably Thomism is as close to nominalism as you can get and not be anomalous, which I right. think is a virtue, a feature, not a bug. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, since this is basics, yeah. let's, let's spend some time on this, right? Yeah. There's a lot of terms we just dropped. Realism, yeah. essences. Yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. Let's, let's, let's go into that if you don't mind. Sure. So, um, a, a nominalist will say, you know, at the very least, the only thing that exists in rebus, right, on on the side of things, is particular. Okay, uh, there's nothing abstract or universal that exists uh, outside of minds. Now, nominalists will debate whether or not there's there's something called conceptualism. We'll say, uh, yeah, no, there's essences, but they only exist as um, sort of subjective concepts in minds, right? Um, and there's no correlate to them in. Um, in 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 the things okay so at one extreme like your most you know an almost like like vulgar caricature of nominalism would say all there are individual things and and if you say oh there there's there's four dogs in the backyard literally there's nothing in common among the dogs 
right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It just so happens for pragmatic reasons, we have grouped those things and called them dogs. And literally speaking, there is nothing really in common. Because if you said there's something in common among them, you're going to have to say there's a universal in the things. Somehow, right. right. And you're going to, you're going to be away from nominalism at that point. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Then the other most extreme position often called Platonism, but I think has precious little to do with Plato, but anyway, okay. Um, there are people who will say, no, ultimately there are abstract things. There are universals, there are real commonalities and they exist in the same sense as the individual things do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, this extreme form of realism would say, let's say you've got four dogs in the yard. Well, you'd count four times for the individual dogs and you have to count a fifth time because now there's a universal dog too, right? right. Mm -hmm. That exists in the same sense, right? Um, as, as the dogs, right? And, um, and, and we'll just call that extreme realism. Extreme realism. Yeah. I mean, Hegel puts it like to take this position to say that the universal exists as a particular, right? right. Okay. Right. And, by the, and by the way, just, yeah. just this is yeah. for people who are totally new to this, this is this is often known as just the problem of universals. And it's, it's asking a question of how do we, you know, it's a, it's, it is a, I would say a species of the question of the one and the many in a sense, yes. right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. It is the question of one and the many. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Aquinas stakes out and, you know, they're, you know, this is, okay, here we go. Uh, Aquinas has this view where he, he doesn't think universals uh, exist independently of our cognition of them in a sense, right? So he thinks we are cognizing a real commonality among the dogs when I say, hey, there's four dogs in the backyard, okay? But he doesn't think the commonality exists in the particular thing as universal. It's There's a particularized essence in right. the dogs, okay? And when we cognize it, it becomes universal, okay? Um, and, and it's interesting. Uh, this is the, I think it's one of the most romantic things about Thomas's view, and people like don't stop and like like ponder it. Is so it, if you if you go with Thomas, you know the, the more universal something is, the 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 less concrete it is, the closer it is to the divine, right? Because it's getting closer to the mind of God, right? Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. And so when you and I cognize, oh, there's four dogs in the backyard, and we realize the commonality, and we think of the universal, it, nature just got promoted. Mm -hmm. Like nature came to a more, a, a fuller, more universal kind of being in virtue of our thinking about it. Right. Because we bring it up into the universal. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's why, I mean, like, like that's one reason why, why Aquinas thinks we have this really special place in nature is by our showing up and cognizing, we're constantly promoting mere material beings with particularized essences into a shared common universal essence yeah. right yeah so so this is the reason this is important is uh nominalism has a, a whole bunch of issues and i think it's, it's ultimately gonna um end up in in self-defeat and and incoherence i mean even if you if you talk about well why do you i think Bertrand and russell pointed this out right like why do you uh say why do we you know call those four things dogs and if somebody wants to say well it's because they resemble each other well even the idea of resemblance is a universal right so like yeah. it's 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 at the end of the day i would say it's, it's going to be impossible to get away from some form of, of realism and then the question is well what brand of realism right and we've got sort of the extreme realism of plato that you that you've outlined and you know then we have of course a sort of more modern realism which would say okay forget the forget the realm of the forms uh, there's the, there's the particularized things, right. And then there's our, our ability to abstract. And then there, uh, of course, is this sort of call it a scholastic realism, right. Yeah. Which says, now we still need some other grounding reality here. And that at the end of the day is going to be the mind of God, right. Yeah. And that everything at the end of the day that is particularized is going to be somehow a finite participation of the divine idea, because we would say God only has one idea, right? Yeah. Some particularized yeah. participation of the divine idea. So in a sense, classic realism kind of like moves the realm of the forms into the concrete reality of the of God's intellect, right? Um, so just to give people kind of a survey of different options, of course, there's many, there's many schools within these schools too, which is where it gets really complicated. And and certainly there's there's Thomas who debate exactly where Thomas uh falls, but Jim uh I think the, the one that you articulated seems very close to, to Haldane's interpretation as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and mean, that's probably where I picked it up. Patrick, so. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right <laughs> yeah. on board with you. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that might've just like, we just took a turn to the abstract really quickly. Why do you, why is that important? Right. Because this is like such a perennial question, but for somebody who has no, uh, ex you know, prior introduction to philosophy, like 
they're going to hear everything we just said. They'll be like, well, why the heck do I care about any of that? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, so, uh, probably, so I, I think basically you could say is, you know, two of the big debates in the, um, in the medieval university were the attorney of the world debate. Okay. Which I find fascinating. And the, the, the debate about universals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why is, why is the debate about universals so important? Well, it, there's no, at least, I mean, I even say metaphysical or ethical issue left or epistemological issue left untouched by your stance on universal. The, the downstream yeah. effects of yeah. how you answer this question are enormous. Yeah. That's exactly so what I wanted to get if, at, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you think, you know, uh, everything is radically particular, then, then that's going to cohere rather well with a certain kind of materialism. Uh, if you think, no, there, there are abstract and we know them, that doesn't really cohere very well with materialism. Um, if whether or not, and this is, you know, maybe relevant to us today, whether or not something is a chicken or a horse is a matter of convention or whether it's grounded in a uh, universal, uh, that has definite ethical consequences as we've learned recently. Um, you know, in terms of epistemology, obviously, you know, what am I doing when I'm cognizing? Am I, am I, uh, abstract universal or am I merely, you know, pointing to a resemblance class, right? Um, in terms of uh, philosophy of mind and issues about, you know, the relationship between, you know, uh, cognition and matter, right? It has deep consequences for that. So the, the problem of universals is one of the debates and you could kind of teach the whole spectrum of philosophy, you know, from that question, right? Right. Um, and, and that has been done. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's why I want to make that the, uh, the first point. And I saw somebody asked here, maybe this would be a good time to start turning to questions and then we could go through the other points in, in 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 other series um somebody asked you know what what are the evidence what is the evidence of, of essences and i think this is a really good question because i'd certainly be with david oderberg and saying there's you're not going to find an empirical test for an essence right because because yeah. you've already made a category mistake um if, if that's the route you're going i think one thing we can do is just your typical rhetorician strategy at the end of the day if like you want to say that that everything is just a product or convention of the mind yeah. Right. Just keep tracing that back. You're going to have an issue because eventually you're going to get to the mind itself. Right. Like, yeah. is the mind itself a product of the mind? Because then then we have a sort of bootstrapping problem here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, and, and we're going to have this sort of this vicious circularity, it seems, is going to be a complete non-starter. So it's like, OK, we'll at least have to grant at least one essence. Right. That the mind or, 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 or you know, uh, yeah, or reason or something like that. Right. And then once, once that's on the table, it seems like, well, why, why deny what seems obvious, right? Because it, yeah. it would seem like a, <laughs> it'd be, it seemed like a miracle, the no miracles argument that the world would, it certainly seems to be essentialist, right? So it'd kind of be a miracle yeah. if it, if it, if it weren't actually essentialist, depending and seeing how things operate. Um, yeah. So anything yet, yeah. why don't you? I mean, I, mean, I think, I think very often what goes on in these debates is you have a confusion between the question of whether or not there are essences and the question of whether or not we have a fallible relationship to what the essences are. Mm. Okay. And so usually what you'll get is, you know, here's why I don't think there are essences because, you know, at one time we thought X and Y were distinct natural kinds and deeper scientific, uh, you know, inquiry have shown that X and Y are not in fact distinct natural kinds, right? That they have like a ca common causal etiology or something like that. Okay. Well, yeah, but so what you've done is you just you presumed a kind of essentialism and explanation that lies below the appearances, right? So it, it seems to me that the, that the case against essences always presupposes a deeper essentialism in the backdrop of a better explanation for things. Do, do you see my point? Mm -hmm. um, and so then, then going back to your point, Pat, is that then you've got a burden of proof issue. Okay, so certainly the way most languages work are, you know, they're, they're, they're going to most, okay. They involve subject predicate relations, right? The natural way of understanding predicates is in terms of, you know, class membership. And, um, you do get, you do get all sorts of problems. You say class memberships are all, uh, conventional. Okay. So I think you're going to say the burden of proof is on the anti-essentialist. Okay. But the anti-essentialist arguments then typically presuppose a deeper causal essentialism in the background. So I don't think they ever even get off the ground. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Good. 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 Shall we? Uh, you, you tell, about I just wrote a paper on this. You can see why I just Unabomber trees. <laughs> <weird. laughs> no, it's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michael, how you feel about all this? Should we? Should we take some questions? Or yeah, one of them that I saw that came up is it wasn't directed to anyone specifically. So either one of y'all or both take a stab at it. Um, is there anything in nominalism that is appealing to you? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there there is an appeal to it in that uh, it is not easy, ultimately, to make sense of of essences, right? Um, there are, you know, we, we do seem to have a fallible relationship to them, right? Um, you know, the, the relationship between the the one, right, the universal and the particular, the many, is famously hard to spell out, right? Mm -hmm. We do have to sort of like like create this whole heavy uh, metaphysical ontological apparatus to make sense of it. So, um, yeah, this this goes back to, you know, Occam's famous razor, right? Um, that, you know, it just, that essentialism or realism about universals creates all sorts of metaphysical problems. And if we could get by without it, then it would seem we would do well to get by without it. The problem is, is I don't think we can get by without it, right? I think the right. case for it is pretty strong. Yeah, yeah my my attracted, uh, what attracts me to nominalism is really the same thing that attracts me to reductionism, right? There's there's a sort of elegance and simplicity to it that is elegant, sim simple, and I think at the end of the day, false. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, it, well, there, there, there was another one here, but I think you had more, I'm sorry. No, no, that's 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 all I'll I'll add to that. And you know, there's certain um, ways that um, nominalism uh, could be could be lent to uh, different um, schools of logic, which I think has been very useful, right? But we shouldn't confuse. This is a theme that Jim and I have harped on on my podcast a number of times: a method with a metaphysics, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But Not we can we can save that for a, another conversation. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure I'm really following this question. I think I might know where they're coming from, uh, but I'm a little uncertain. What is the best argument against the energy itself being the first cause of the universe, given it cannot be created or destroyed, as opposed to God as first cause? So this is a relevant question. I, I literally just had a conversation with Rob Coons on, on my YouTube channel. Ooh. And uh, he's he's obviously done a lot of work on cosmological arguments, and this this would relate to what's called the stage two of the cosmological argument. So, for people who are interested, the cosmological argument, at least in the contemporary discussion, has kind of been broken into two phases. The, the first phase or the first stage is to try to argue that there has to be some uncaused or necessary being, right? And there's been a lot of actual convergence and agreement, it seems, on that. So. Uh, to those who say philosophy never makes progress, this would actually seem to be one area where it genuinely has, where theists and, and atheists and agnostics have have kind of converged, uh, you know, on this on this theme of a necessary reality or an uncaused being. And then uh, stage two is just trying to unpack. Well, what well, what is that thing? Like, what 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 could that possibly be? Right. I think the the best argument against it is Aquinas' Dante, right? Because he actually goes it in reverse. He first starts with the hypothetical that if some reality exists in virtue of what it is, something that's intrinsically uncausable, then what would that reality have to be? And he'll argue it has to be a pure active existence existing through itself, right? Because it's not going to be susceptible to any differentiating features. I won't rehearse the whole argument here because I've got a, I've done it a million times on my YouTube channel. If people want to hear it and they can just go read Aquinas's De Ente. So that's that. And the, the long story short is that's, that's going to eliminate uh, any material, reality. So if you think of energy as, as something material, which um, I think most people would, it's going to rule out energy, it's going to rule out the sort of a, a initial state of the universe, uh, anything finite, uh, bounded, restricted, etc. And then in the conversation I had with Rob Coons, he just offered some additional lines of support. So if, if that's a question in somebody's mind, I would just yeah. head over to my YouTube channel and, and check that out. But yeah, let's get Jim in on it. Yeah, th this this might be well, this is very unsophisticated from a physics standpoint because i'm going to base it on you know my uh my, my children's like sixth grade physics textbook right but but you know i'm always struck whenever i teach that lesson <laughs> to my kids uh how you know deaf energy you know i remember this going back to when i was in school right energy is defined as a capacity to do work okay um it so we define energy as a potency all right um and there are, you know, well, so potencies don't do things, right? Potencies 
our preparednesses to do things, mm -hmm. right? They're they're lying in wait to do things, okay? Um, and I'm, I'd be willing to argue in favor of the notion that, look, uh, the idea that the ultimate explanation of everything is potency, not actuality, right? Aristotle's, phys Aristotle's metaphysics, right? Um, it isn't going to ultimately work, okay? Mm -hmm. Right? Do, do you see my point? Um, and I think even claiming that everything at right. bottom is energy. Well, not every, everything at bottom can't be potential to be. Everything right. at, at bottom has to be, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah all, so, all, all potency has to ultimately be grounded in something that is more fundamentally act, actual. Right? Act yeah. is prior to potency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I think implicit in these in this in this kind of question, I, I don't mean to attack the question. It's a fair. It's question, a, no, it's right? a good question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is always this assumption that what we're looking for in a first cause is a first temporal cause, right? Because there, you know, I, I think the arguments, you know, that energy has to be finite in duration, right? Are different from and maybe stronger than the claim that the universe does or doesn't have a creator do you see my point okay so even if you could show to me yeah at bottom the universe is energy whatever that means okay and energy need not have come to be in the first place okay fine that has nothing to do with the thomistic arguments that has nothing to do with thomas arguments and that's why i think the 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 real important thing that thomas is to teach us is the eternity of the world debate right and thomas's position in this debate was yeah, he thought the world was not eternal, but that was de fide, only because as a good Catholic, he, he thought the world was finite. He didn't think you could prove it one way or another, right? And in fact, he's willing to grant the eternity of the world in some of his arguments for God's existence, right? Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with where the stuff came from in the first place, okay? So maybe there's no sense to be made of where energy came from, okay? But that's different from what we're asking here. We're asking, why is anything actually what it is, not... Why are things potentially the way they are? Yeah. It, the, the interesting uh, question with energy these days among Thomas is whether we can equate it with prime matter. That's yeah. an that's an ongoing debate with Thomas. And we'll talk about prime matter and, and the role that plays metaphysically. And I'm not personally convinced of that, that question, but I'm uh, uh, that position, but I'm, I'm open to it. Uh, and it's sort of, uh, yeah, it's just a lively discussion within with within Thomism. And the reason I bring that up is it, it links to how you, you what you just said about that, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there was a question I saw. I want to make sure we get it. I, I don't have it up here, uh, but I saw it come in earlier. Somebody asked if there was just a basic, I think, glossary of of, of terms for the uh, interested or budding Thomas. And in fact, there is, and it couldn't be more convenient because I have it right in my hands. The One and the Many by Father Norris Clark. If you get this book and you just go to the back of it, he's got this just really handy glossary of Thomistic terms, composition, creation, essence, Evil, finality, good, hylomorphism, law, matter, beauty, act, potency, analogy, you name it. So uh, we will be covering more of these in, in future lectures. But this would be if I were to assign a text for this for this course, maybe maybe I would assign this one, Jim. Do you have do you have, do you have one that you would uh, encourage? Yeah, that, that would def that would definitely be, you know, one of the top three consider you know, th that I would consider. Yeah. Um, when I, when I, I have used that in a metaphysics course, um, but I also, now I, I tend to use original text in my metaphysics course. So if I'm doing it this fall and I'm doing, um, Aristotle's metaphysics and Hegel's science of logic, right? Yeah. Uh, this one is from Kyle. If abstracts are causally inerrant and they help lead us, uh, closer to the mind of God, wouldn't this make God's mind causally inerrant? Well, God is a concrete entity, so no. And I think he means causally inert, not inerrant. Um, yeah, yeah, I was trying to figure it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, there's a whole, you know, as, as anything else, there's a great debate of like what, what exactly is an abstract entity. But the idea is that it, whatever else it is, it has no causal efficacy in the world, right? Um, but when we talk about God, we're not talking yeah. about an abstract entity. We're talking about a concrete. Yeah. Entity, right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and this, this, I mean, this is, this is kind of taken care of at the beginning, right? So Aristotle uh, takes Plato to issue on this, on this point. Okay. So, um, you know, Aristotle, you know, takes Plato to issue in the sense that like, okay, pointing out that there are forms, there are ideas, there are abstract universals and, saying that they have a kind of independent existence doesn't explain what is moving stuff to them, 
Okay. It doesn't explain. So, I mean, Aristotle would say, hey, player, you're right. Abstracta are causally inert. So what, what good does your positing of separate forms do in terms of giving me, Aristotle, ever the grounded scientist, an account of nature, right? And this is why Aristotle, this is like really what's running Aristotle's first way or, and his, his mo arguing for God's existence from motion is to say, well, stuff is moving, right? Uh, what is moving all the stuff ultimately? And, and it's important to note too, I think people miss this in Aristotle's argument is what is moving stuff is their attraction to God, right? It's their attraction to him. It's not God like pulling them, right? It's their desiring of their their ultimate essences in the mind of God, right? So it's not as if the 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 for Aristotle, the ideas in the mind of God reach down and grab things and pull them up. It's everything loves what it is and knows what it is is ultimately in these essences, which Aristotle thinks ultimately are the being of God, right? And things are pursuing it, right? So that, that notion of like like the the uh, inert nature of abstract objects is well known even all the way going back to the Greeks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there was another question on here. Do the guests agree with the distinction by Scotus on the univocity and the concept of being? I do not think being is univocal, <laughs> right, at all. I, I, I'm with Aristotle. I think being is said in many ways, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I, as I think, I know, I mean, okay, first of all, Scotus is a big place. So I don't like dismissing, you know, with a hand wave, right? But I do think if you go university of being, you're going to be on your way to either to one of the extremes on universals. Every, either everything turns out universal or everything turns out particular because you only got one sense of being. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and same with, with knowledge. I've defended also that not only is, is it, just as being comes in many ways, so does, so does knowledge, right? And I think a lot of epistemological problems could be solved once we understand that knowledge, like being, is um, susceptible to analogical predication, right? Gentlemen, I really want to thank you all for coming on and doing this. I know your time is valuable. Thank you. This has been helpful. What, what can we can, look can I hit, can I hit one more? Can I hit one yeah, more? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. 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 I saw somebody in the question here. I can't remember who it was. Raised the issue of classical atomism. And said, yeah, it was, uh, uh, that's a great question, right? Uh, Trend Parsifal uh, says, the atomists got this right. The world is made of tiny particles and what are called secondary substances are emergent properties. Okay. Man, okay. Fair enough. But, uh, but because something's emergent doesn't mean it's not a natural kind. Right. Um, do, do, do you see my point? Right. Uh, the, like, Th that something's emergent doesn't make it any less real. It doesn't make it any less objective, right? Um, that it has a, a causal etiology that it's distinct from what we might have expect based on observation does not undermine its reality, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think those kinds of, although it's a good question, right? I think those kinds of questions bake the reductionism into the cake, right? To say, if we have a causal account of something, then it's not real, right? Well, I, I, don't, I don't see that as following at all. And that would, that would be a premise that needs to be defended. Right. So I have I have no problem saying an organism is an emergent entity uh, from the the particles. Right. OK. But I also think that the, the, it's complicated. Right. It's an emergence that is up and down. Right. Uh, but that doesn't mean the organism is not real. It just means it's causally dependent on its particles. Right. Right. No big news there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not that's not incompatible, nor would that be surprising for a Thomistic world. No, mm -hmm. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what could we look forward to for for the next one? Yeah, I, well, if uh, if you guys are cool with it, I have these other four points. I this I think this worked out really well because it it helped us kind of. We didn't plan to start with the with the problem of universals, but I'm I'm almost oh, glad we did because it's so, here we are now we're stuck such, with it. Yeah, now now we're stuck with it, and that was the first point on my my uh, Thomistic uh, checklist here. So we can um we can uh, I think you know maybe next time we can review some of that uh and and maybe um close any threads that, that remained open. Yeah. But then uh, but then I have points here on how Thomas think about ideas and, and cognition, about morality, uh, about yeah, philosophy of nature, God, um, all that good stuff. So but also you know, uh, very willing and happy to go wherever the audience uh, is curious about and follow Jim as well. So yeah. I I, I'm not a guy who sets a hard syllabus for anything. So no, I'm not. I'm not either. Now my, my, my syllabi I'm, now are basically here's a couple books. We're going to read these. I'll keep you posted. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, uh, sounds good. And Dr. Well, uh, I should say, Jim, do you have um, any books or lectures or anything like that that you want to direct our audience uh, to? Um, you know, if you uh, if you go to uh, jdmadden.com uh, on the philosophy side, you'll see a, 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 a there's a link to my book at Amazon. There's the introduction to my new book that should be coming out in the next year here there. Uh, that you can you can access right away, and there's also links to all the lectures I did, not all, many of the lectures I've done for the Thomistic Institute and various podcasts and things like that. So, if the viewers slash listener would like to check out jdmadden.com, uh, that you'll you'll find a lot of resources related to what we've talked about here today too. So, um, Pat, do you have a plug that that you can put in for your work? Um, well, I would say related to this conversation, um, check out the. Uh, it was probably about an hour and a half to two hour long conversation that Jim and I had on what is Platonism. Yeah, that over, was a good one. Over at my YouTube channel. Yeah, uh, that's so on my did, website too. Yeah. yeah. So if you just if you just Google the Pat Flynn Show, that's that's my podcast. Uh, you'll get lots of more conversations like these. Uh, so if you if you like what we're doing here, if you like this series, I would just direct people in that way. Yep. Yep. By all means. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, we will discuss off the air uh, some dates for a future show. I really look forward to it. And thank y'all so much for coming on. Thank you, Michael. This has been a blast. Yep. And everybody, thank, thank y'all. Thank yeah, thanks for the working. questions, too. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And by the way, if y'all have any additional questions that we didn't get to, go ahead and put them in the chat whenever this posts to YouTube. Uh, we'll do our best to maybe so, get to yeah. some of those if if time permits. You know, I don't want to speak for anybody here, but uh, y'all. No, no, I, I would love that, especially for people who watch this after the fact. If you have topics or questions you'd like us to consider uh, in this series, please do post those. That would be great. Yep. Mm -hmm. By all means. Excellent. And again, uh, like I always say, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason of theology. You'll get access to extra content and also uh, an opportunity to support what we're doing here so that we can continue to provide content for free. All right, that's going to do it. Everybody have a good weekend and uh, God bless you all. Thanks. Have you ever used a business service just to find out later that they publicly promote views contrary to God's law? If so, then check out stanthonyservices.org where you'll find a Catholic vendor in your area that will offer top quality services. Simply go to the website and share some basic information with St. Anthony Services or call 1-877-LIFE-US1. What are you waiting for? Check out stanthonyservices.org and support your fellow Catholic professionals today. And tell them RNT sent you.